I have it's kind of a had a, I grew up in Coquitlam as a teenager, so I was a farm boy in Chilliwack, came to Coquitlam, and my neighbor, I, I got into fishing, angling, and they used to take me down to the Coquitlam River, and we used to try and fish for jack chinook and uh, trout, whatever, we, suckers, whatever you could catch. Didn't do very well, but hey, uh, we tried. But, you know, that was my first 1960s, late 1960s and the 70s. You know, I, so I have a long history with the um, Coquitlam River. Yep. Well, I think these were historic side channels going back uh, to the pre-damming. So the river floodplain would have spread, broken up, spread out all over the the uh, uh, area of the valley bottom. And, um, and typically, juvenile fish and certain species of salmon like to spawn in side channels. Okay, Slower flows, lots of gravel, nice ripples, lots of invertebrate production, lots of oxygen, so the ripply oxygenates the water. So chum salmon in particular, particularly over there's groundwater, they love it. Uh, and uh, um, coho salmon, those are the two species of, of the five species of uh, Pacific salmon that we have in the Coquitlam River. Those two species are the most dominant in the side channels. And juvenile and coho love it because they have a life history of mostly a year, but sometimes two years rearing fresh water. So we have done as BCIT, Fish, Wildlife, and Recreation Program, a lot of uh, in-stream population estimates. And, um, and so we've caught fish. And so um, uh, what we do then is do this mark recapture and estimate these very serious ponds that DFO constructed. Uh, this would have been about uh, 15, 20 years ago. Again, I, I don't think I was really part of that, but I've been part of the inventory and assessment uh, for quite a few years since that. So. Uh, invertebrates love it, uh, particularly groundwater. The temperatures are stable. Sometimes the flows are stable. For these ponds, DFO put some pipes through the banks to to increase the flows into these historic channels, dug a few deep holes for fish to hold in. And so um, they're often, the main stem river is really fast and swift, so big species like Chinook and Steelhead, for some reason, pink salmon, pink salmon like uh, main stem gravel, so those uh, three species really like the main river, but these off-channel, smaller little little breakwater, breakout water uh, channels are really important for chum production, which don't rear for very long, although they do rear sometimes a little bit, and then they go out to sea right after they come out of the gravel. And then uh, juvenile um, coho rear, you know, hot, pretty high densities. And I sent you a few reports you can take a look at. And so, really valuable for those two species and there's other species non-game species so sticklebacks a lot of sticklebacks uh some peamount chub uh, probably some northern pike minnows red side shiners and um we've got um uh, lamprey we've got crayfish uh, uh the uh, perhaps the odd dolly varden or bull trout maybe uh the odd steelhead, cutthroat trout, we have steelhead cutthroat trout, we know cutthroat more than steelhead. I think steelhead juveniles like to rear in the main channel. Uh, really don't know if adult steelhead rear in it, but we haven't seen any evidence of, or sorry, spawn in it, but we have seen evidence, particularly in the Riffley areas where steelhead, it's Riff, Riffley areas is more steelhead habitat, cutthroat seems to like pools, uh, and so um, coho and cutthroat sort of mix in there. Wow. Yep. And, and there's beaver. Right. And there's uh, mallards, and there's uh, king, you know, kingfishers. There's bear, bear wandering around trying to eat the uh, sa adult salmon. And the, the city of Coquitlam has to put up signs, you know, <laughs> beware of bear and, and do dogs and people. And you know, it's a very rich uh, human uh, plant life, uh, fish life, aquatic, uh, algal communities, all that kind of stuff. So it's a uh, I don't know how to really describe it, but it was a it was a it was a happy accident, you know. It was um, a happy little thing that happened because a few people had really uh, uh, foresight to work on it. And somebody said, "Oh, let's put some trails in there." So put a little. I, I'm not particularly a fan of the trails because um, I think people kind of beat up the riparian area, the vegetation, but it gets them out there, you know. And people are always when we do our minnow trapping, they always ask us and. Um, and uh you know it's just one of those things where um uh there's this you know we give and take a little bit but it's a it was a happy accident that it turned out just so positively and so well right now we're 
standing at the Oxbow side channel of the Coquitlam River. The Oxbow side channel is over here. And the Coquitlam River is over here. Okay, we're talking about the Coquitlam River watershed, and the Coquitlam River has had a long history of basically damage uh, through human anthropogenic uh, effects. Uh, um, probably, well, it depends on you know the the exact uh, nature of the uh, or amplitude of the effects. Uh, logging, so land clearing would have been one of the first ones, but also a dam went up in the early part of the of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, this is water supply for New Westminster, a small head dam, and it sort of was probably an obstacle to fish getting up into Quitlam Lake. So the sockeye that were so uh, precious to the First Nations, Quitlam apparently means um, redfish going up the river, and sockeye must have been big numbers. When I was a kid, there were still the old fishing stands, the dip net stands uh, in the lower river down by the um, uh, Essendale, the Institute, uh, Riverside, and so those uh, stands probably long gone. They brought it away, but uh, they were they were there, and so the First Nations communities used to dip fish. As land clearing took place, uh, so a lot of the uh, sediment would come in and probably destroy reds, and so uh, the modern day issues are mostly development of landscapes. So uh, water inputs off of the landscapes really important natural hydrographs and so what you end up having is you have more roads more shopping malls more hard rooftops water that comes down as rain rather than sinking through the forest and into the ground and slowly seeping into the river comes down in a great big flash goes onto pavement goes into storm drain sooners and sewers and swishes into the river that's bad news you change the flow regime and then we have a non-point source solution. So putting fertilizers on your lawn, putting pesticides on your lawn, gardening, all uh, brake fluid, uh, dust from your tires, uh, big issue with coho down in the Puget Sound area. Um, tires, um, little bits of rubber going into, very bad for coho in particular. So we have these, um, have these issues. 